today you could be 1,000 meters, 3,000 feet up this great ice rock face up there in the Himalayas. And so there you are, you know, you're getting a little tired, you're hanging on like that, and you're looking around, of course, for that ledge that you thought you saw during your reconnaissance. I've got a theory about ledges, you know. I have never found a ledge. Well, what do you do? You know, you're hanging there and the sun's going down in the west and all that lovely gold red light flushing across the mountainside and you're hanging on there and things start happening. You know, your communication changes with your climbing partner for a start. At the bottom, it's sort of swaggering and confident. About halfway up, it starts to be sort of, well, cool, calm and collected. And at this point, it changes a great deal. In fact, it's gone up several octaves. It, sort of shrieking, what do you mean you can't find a ledge? The sun's going down. Well, if you can't find a ledge, you've got to make a ledge. So you find a place where the ice and snow isn't quite so steep, and you're hanging on with your ice axes, and you take one out very carefully, and you hack away at the ice in front of you until you cut out a ledge, oh, about two meters long and about 30 centimeters wide, because you've got to be able to lie down and relax. It doesn't matter where you are. So you're hanging on like that and you're feeling a little quivery, you know, it's not that easy. And because you're a little scared, you're twisting in a few extra eye screws. We'll put three or four in, I think. We'll put them in up there and you clip into all of these and you clip that into your harness. And then you pull out the sleeping mat from your pack and you put that onto the ledge and you tie that on as well because you've got to tie everything onto these ledges because if it slips off, it'll go a thousand meters down and you're not going to get it back. So out comes your sleeping bag and you put that out too and you tie that on. If you drop anything off these ledges, they make a very characteristic noise. You know, if you push a little stone off the edge or whatever it might be, it goes ding, ding, dong, 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 as it goes further and further down that great face that you've actually tried to pretend isn't there at all. While you just focus on your ledge, you know, that's not there. I'm cutting that out. I don't even know it's there anymore. But you know, the worst thing about that noise, I mean, I don't personally dislike that noise, but it is a reminder that if you make a mistake, you too could make a noise like that. <laughs> when you do push something over the edge and you hear that noise, the first thing that happens is both of you swing around and you quickly check all your ice screws and make sure you're tied on properly and uh, make sure everything's okay. Well, okay, you've had your meal, you're on your ledge, now you've got to get on with the business of having a decent sleep. You've got to try to relax. Now look, I'm not going to try to tell you we have a deep, meaningful sort of sleep. We don't. You know, it's a very light slumber, but it's, it's relaxation. It's better than sort of sitting bolt upright feeling tense all night. So you, you, we have a variety of techniques here. And my technique is to lie on my side and face into the mountain. You see, for me, it's like communing with nature. Um, if you come out of a, a light slumber, I can feel out into the darkness in front of me, and ah, yes, rock and ice. You know, there she is, Mother Nature. I know where I am. I find that vaguely reassuring. Some of my friends, however, have a different technique. They like to uh, look out in the other direction. I call it the fresh air approach. Um, they look out towards the sky and the stars. Now, I don't have anything against the vista of stars you see during these, these climbs on big mountains. But it's when you observe that some of the stars are, in fact, below you that I have a bit of a problem. Sometimes people find it surprising. They think of climbing Mount Everest or going to the South Pole and they think, does this have anything in common with a normal business practice? Well, it's actually remarkable how similar they all are. The, the preparation that's involved, the, frankly, the focus and the determination to see a particular project through. And then just the, the capacity to tolerate your teammates and never to lose sight of where you want to go. These are incredibly important things. But also, I think, you know, to take up the opportunities along the way. Things change. You may need to change direction. That happens in business just as it does up on a mountain. You may have to change the particular route that you're taking to climb the mountain. Conditions may change. The seasons change. And these have great commonality from mountaineering expeditions right through to the business place. There's almost a rule of a bivouac on a high mountain. By 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, we're both sitting bolt upright. We're both cold and pretty scared. And maybe you think maybe mountaineers never do feel 
frightened, but I can tell you we all do feel frightened. In actual fact, fear is an incredibly important thing because if you didn't feel fear, then you would be dangerous. You wouldn't care. You wouldn't care if you were tied on or if you fell off or anything else. Fear makes you thorough. Fear, fear makes you careful. In fact, fear can make you good at what you do. A little bit of anxiety, a little bit of tension is absolutely critical. Now look, that doesn't have to mean you're hanging on ice axes up on a mountainside. It can be anything. It could be public speaking. It could be putting together a business or a presentation. It really could be anything. It's where there is a bit of tension. And those are the things that I believe are truly powerful. And to make those work, you need a desire, a real burning ambition to make it work. You know, one thing I believe is that actually most of us are not truly exceptional. We're all reasonably good at things, but what really makes it work is perseverance and determination. I'm not an exceptional climber, but I've been determined to get there. And if I get knocked back, you come back again with a, another approach. See if you can make this one work. My life has, has been a life of my making, and I think that is a, an opportunity that everyone has to seize from their own perspective. I know not, that not everyone wants to do the sort of things that I've done, but that there, there are things that they want to do. And so my life is, has, for me, has been going to the sort of places that I feel compelled to go to and to have those sorts of experiences. But what's important about it is the opportunity to learn something from it so you can apply it to the next experience. And I got ahead of my climbing partners and I got onto the summit of the mountain and what a fantastic place it was. Great views all around, great vistas right out over Tibet and the Himalayas spreading to the east and the west. It certainly is a great place to go if you like a view, I've got to say. If you like views, climb Mount Everest. But it's a, a rather awe-inspiring place because you know that the job isn't done until you've got yourself right down again. Well, a short time later, my two climbing partners joined me on the summit. And with them came our walkie-talkie. And I've got to say, I've got to hand it to the media. They're very quick on the line. The first call was from a journalist here in Melbourne, and he had a question for me. Now, you've got to remember, I'm standing on the summit of Mount Everest, and he says, Peter, well done. How does it feel to follow in your father's footsteps? Now, look, I've had that thrown at me a few times in my life. I'm standing on the summit of Mount Everest, and I remember thinking, what am I going to say to him? And I was looking around, looking for a little inspiration, and something occurred to me. I grabbed the walkie-talkie. I said, look, I've had a really good look around, but I can't see Dad's footprints anywhere. <laughs> well, then I had to get on with the very serious business of getting yourself back down to base camp because the job isn't done until you get yourself right down again. I mean, getting to the top has certainly been the goal of the whole trip, but getting yourself safely down in one piece and all the members of the expedition is when you've actually completed the task properly. But you know, I had one final surprise on getting to base camp, and that was as I got into the safety of camp, having successfully reached the summit, I actually felt depressed. I thought, why do I feel depressed? I've climbed Mount Everest. I've been working towards this for many years. And then I realized that what the reason was. You know, when you reach a goal, you reach a summit, you've actually lost something. Something that you've been striving towards for so long. You've lost it because you've gained it. And when you've gained it, you've put it behind you and you've got nothing in front of you. And there's really only one solution. To keep coming up with new challenges. New challenges that excite you and inspire you. And I must say, I haven't had too much difficulty with that. I'm, I'm very proud of having climbed Mount Everest, but it's a been there, done that. What is important to me now is what I'm doing now and what lies ahead. And can I leave you with one thing? The challenges that lie ahead of you are the thing that you want to become. Those are the things you're aiming for, so go for it. Thank you very much.